Fire Emblem Engage is just so funny to me. You'll play a chapter with six jacked up muscle milk chugging bosses all bearing down on you, each of them with multiple health bars. So you'll have to carefully weigh every single strategic decision and use every single game mechanic to barely squeak out the W. So you'll think, this is the best Fire Emblem game. Then the characters start talking and you'll think, this is the worst Fire Emblem game, man, turn this shit off! What is Fire Emblem Engage? Fire Emblem Engage is the latest entry in Nintendo's long-running strategy role-playing game series. Engage is also an anniversary celebration of all previous games in the series, featuring appearances from 12 main characters from previous Fire Emblem games. The gameplay loop is, you play advanced chess, and then your pieces talk to each other between battles. Have some story, hang out, do some cooking. And you too can do some cooking with today's sponsor, HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get fresh pre-portioned ingredients delivered right to your doorstep. Count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. As you all know, I'm currently training for the World Frisbee Golf Championships, and with HelloFresh's calorie smart and carb smart recipes, I can customize my meals to maximize my gains. After ordering way too many Frisbees, I'm trying to save some money this year, so it's great that HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% cheaper than takeout. After a long day's work at the Frisbee golf course, I want to eat real soon, which is why I'm glad that HelloFresh's line of meals featuring robust flavors and filling portions are ready in less than 15 minutes. Yum yum. To try HelloFresh, use the code on screen or simply click the link below for a special limited time discount plus free shipping and try HelloFresh today. Perspective. I don't mention it too often on here, but Fire Emblem is my favorite game series. I've been playing it for almost two decades at this point, since FE7 came to the Game Boy Advance. And I've pretty much played every game in the series. I've played some of these ones using a translation patch, and I've finished all of these ones, most of them multiple times. The only game I did not like was Fire Emblem Fates for a variety of reasons, but even then I'd still say it has redeeming qualities like the excellent soundtrack. If I had to pick a top 5 favorite FE games in no particular order, I'd say these ones. I'm not saying all of this to say that my opinion is more valid than someone else is quite the opposite actually. I think there's more to be learned from a fresh perspective than from someone like me who Stockholm syndrome themselves into playing through all these waifu wars. It's just where I'm coming from. And I play Fire Emblem for the full package. The strategic gameplay, the interesting stories, the engaging characters, the awesome music, all of it. It's a lot of fun. But even with all my experience, I would not call myself an expert Fire Emblem player by any means. The hardest difficulty I ever finished was Three Houses is Silver Snow Maddening, which even then was on New Game Plus with liberal application of the Chalice of Beginnings, aka the most broken item in Fire Emblem history. I've played Engage once on Hard Classic without looking up anything like growth rates or future skills or guides, just going purely based on info available in the game at the time. I usually play on normal the first time through an FE game, then crank up the difficulty on repeat playthroughs, but reviews said that this was one of the easier FE games, and it is. My friends who did start on normal all said they regretted it. You can lower the difficulty down to normal, but you can't raise it back up afterwards, and if I was to ever replay this game, I'd probably do it on maddening now that I know the mechanics better. The way I played classic mode is making it through every level without losing a single unit, and if my artisanally crafted strategy midway through a 2 hour long map gets ruined because Fogato gets killed by a 2% crit chance, yeah I'm gonna hit the rewind button cause that was some BS. Let's start with the biggest positive of Fire Emblem Engage, and I'm spoiling the whole game by the way, the core strategic gameplay. This section gets pretty technical, so sorry in advance if you're only here for the ha-has. While Engage is one of the easier hard modes, it was still a satisfying challenge for me, since I had to simultaneously learn all the new mechanics, of which there are a lot, and didn't know what the game was going to throw at me next. I heard there was a late game difficulty spike, I didn't see it honestly. I didn't really do any of the bonus level grind skirmishes other than getting footage for this video after I beat the game, but I did do every single paralogue right around chapters 18 to 20, which definitely wrecked the difficulty curve. There certainly were some late game annoyances, like an Olive Garden breadsticks amount of reinforcements, but maybe I got lucky in my unit and weapon choices, maybe I got good level ups, maybe I'm a strategic genius who works out of the library, but for me, it wasn't that bad. In fact, the last stretch overall was maybe the least difficult section for me. The classic turn-based strategy gameplay is back, and despite partially being an anniversary game, Engage introduces many brand new mechanics, which honestly, switching things up is the most Fire Emblem thing that Fire Emblem can do. First there's no weapon triangle, now there's one weapon triangle, now it's weaker, now there's a magic triangle, now there's a magic triangle inside a magic triangle, now bows, magic, and shurikens are all in the weapon triangle, now there's no triangle unless you're on maddening, in which case go fuck yourself. Wyverns are weak against wind and bows, actually never mind, they're weak against thunder magic, so horribly the 
best unit in the game. The series has always had the courage to go, oh, did you like how that thing worked? Fuck you, it's this way now. Engage's new mechanics make this game feel much more player phase focused. In many of the previous games, player phase was spent killing a few dudes, of course, but ultimately setting up so you can survive the next enemy phase. However, with many skills that only activate on player phase, to the new break mechanic, and so on, Engage places much more weight on taking out all the nearby enemies and bosses in one turn. Or at least that's how I played it. Something you'll immediately notice in chapter one is movement is so much smaller than normal. While in previous games, usually on foot have like five move and mounted seven, in Engage, foot units have four movement and mounted five. These are some slow ass horses. While maps themselves are also smaller to make up for this, it's really frustrating if you're more used to the previous games. Since having less movement does lower your turn by turn options of how to position and rearrange your units and who can attack who. I recommend promoting your units as early as possible since everyone gets one extra space of move, which is like a 20 to 25% increase. And after everyone promotes and obtaining more ranged weapon options, small movement is much less noticeable. In addition, movement skills like shove are much less available. Kanto is a high cost inheritable skill, not something available to mounted units by default like many other home console FE games. Reposition isn't inheritable until halfway through the game, and rescue dropping isn't in the game at all as far as I know. There is a smash mechanics where certain weapons can move an enemy back one space after the enemy attacks first, but I went through the whole game without feeling the need to use it. And despite what may be some Fire Emblem fans' greatest desire, in this game you cannot smash your teammates, only the enemies. There are a few engaged techniques for additional movement, like Warp Ragnarok or Goddess Dance or Sigurd being Sigurd, but those are more limited to only a few times per chapter. The next immediately noticeable change is how it handles a weapon triangle. Remember how in most FE games, weapon triangle would slightly affect hit rate and maybe like one point of damage? Well, in Engage, they went full on balls to backboard on the weapon triangle. If you initiate combat with weapon triangle advantage and hit, you will break the enemy, which causes them to drop their weapon. This is medieval times, they didn't have flex seal. And when this happens, they can't counterattack during the rest of that combat and can't counterattack the next unit who attacks them. I'm still not sure how I feel about it. It makes for interesting strategy, especially since the enemy can do it back to you. And there were definitely bosses that I could only beat using the break mechanic than dogpiling. But I think I would prefer it not to come back, at least not in its current form. This feels like it should be like a special attack, like a combat art or something. Not something that automatically happens every single time you attack, you know? Like in Fates and Echoes, weapon durability is gone. This way you can refine and engrave multiple jacked up killing edges and just use those the whole game. Some may call this cheesing through the game. I call it using the tools presented to everyone to turn half my army into FE6 Rutger. Pro tip, I didn't figure this out until like chapter 20, but if you forge a slim lance into an iron lance into a killer lance, it'll be lighter weight and still have the slim lance avoid bonus. Another new ish mechanic is chain attacks. Certain classes can do an additional mini attack if they're within range of the enemy. It's sort of like the pair up from Fates, except it actually feels sort of balanced here, since it's a fixed hit rate and damage. Even if your attack would normally do zero damage, you can still chain attack and do some damage. The enemies can do it back to you, so it makes both dodge tanking and face tanking harder, especially when there are multiple enemies around you. Tamara the tank engine usually takes zero damage from these axe chucking fools. In fact, every enemy here does zero damage to her, but this chip damage for enemy units adds up quick, since they can do it over and over, multiple times one turn, multiple attempts per each attack, even if non-backup units are attacking her, the backup units still get a chance for extra fixed damage regardless of her defense and she'll almost die before she can use Great Aether at the start of her next turn, JESUS CHRIST! Speaking of, the biggest new mechanic, Emblem Engage. Fire Emblem loves to steal mechanics from Persona. Three houses hijack the calendar system, support conversations and paralogues are basically watered down confidants, and Engage just takes Personas wholesale. But here, the Personas are main characters from every previous Fire Emblem game. Ahem! The new engage mechanic will forge you a path of radiance to defeat the shadow dragon. After awakening new emblems in the story, you fight alongside them, level them up, and unlock the mystery of the emblem. They reside within rings embedded with sacred stones, and you can see the hero from each game, showing the series genealogy of the Holy War. You can see the echoes, shadows of Lentia, of abilities and mechanics from the previous games. When you engage with an emblem through a flashy radiant dawn, your character digivolves into a sci-fi looking angel dude with jet engines on their back. I, I don't know how this relates to Fire Emblem. But you engage for three turns. Three houses. Engaging emblems allows your character to use a temporary blade of light, like a blazing blade or even the binding blade. If you're having trouble with the game, you're probably not engaging enough. You need to engage more. The fates may say it is your birthright to lose the battle, but by engaging more often, your newfound power will achieve you a revelation to help you in your conquest of the enemy. You can do 
Gaiden chapters to further increase the bond threshold and reveal a new mystery of the emblem. There's even a side chapter that references Thracia 776. Engage attacks also give you access to once per engage special moves that are really useful and you should spam. In Leaf's side chapter that most players would have warp skipped in the original game, he has a posse of 7 mage knights with 3 ranged tomes that chase you down. However, at one point they all line up like bowling pins, so Sigurd's Stampede Overdrive took out like 5 of them in a single attack. The engage mechanic is really cool. As someone who's familiar with all of Fire Emblem, it was cool seeing all the abilities and weapons referenced in previous games. And it was easy for me to remember what skills each character grants. Lin's doubles are referenced to a critical hit animation. Sigurd's big horsey movement are referenced to his big maps with big horsey movement. I would make a video on all these references, but I'm pretty sure other more knowledgeable people are already working on it. However, I've talked to a few of my friends who have not played very many FE games, and for them it was kind of difficult remembering who each emblem is and what skills each one has. Even many people who did play Three Houses didn't know about the Dance of the Gods Battalion, so they were confused by Byleth's special ability. There's very little story integration to help newer players remember who everyone is and what all their abilities do. More on that later. You can inherit skills from other emblems to permanently equip them, but strap on your cheating Nikes and get ready for some goddamn hurdles, because Fire Emblem Engage is a UX nightmare. Say I want to learn the skill Speed Plus One. Okay, first I have to go to the Somnial, your home base. Load screen. Then I need to go to the Rain Chamber to see how much SP each skill costs to learn. Load screen. Then I need to either remember or write down who should train with who and how much, since I can't see these quantities anywhere else. Then I need to go into the arena. Load screen. Now I need to walk forward. This is stupid. Then I need to watch my character fight the corresponding emblem, only half of which is skippable. If I need to go to a high bond level, I'll need to stop and watch bond conversation where the characters say nothing important, then do the fight again. Oops, I ran out of friendship crystals. I need to load screen, go to the achievement board and collect more. Load screen to get back. Watch characters fight some more. Okay, fast travel back to the ring chamber. Load screen. Okay, now I can go to the ring menu and spend SP, assuming I have enough, to learn the skill. Then close the ring menu, open up the inventory menu, go to the skill sub menu, and equip the skill. All of that, now my guy has one more point in speed. In other FE games, learn the skill through leveling up, pick the skill, equip it. All these segmented areas just to access menus. Imagine if McDonald's drive through was like this. It's a similar problem the three houses had where certain info is available on different screens but not others, but in Engage, a lot of this info is separated by load screens, or at the very least, closing one menu and opening another, and constantly having to hop between them. There's even minor inconveniences that add up across an entire playthrough into huge annoyances. In battle, I move my guy to attack, but then why is Engage Engage always the default option above attack. In the pause menu, why is emblem ring always the first option above inventory? Why is the X button not menu? In a console game with face buttons, plus button should not be the menu. X button should be menu. Come on, y'all. Speaking of skills, you won't get to equip very many. In Fates and Three Houses, characters had their personal skill and five skill slots. In Engage, characters have their one personal skill, two choosable skill slots, and one promoted class skill after they reach level five in an upper class. But you can't transfer skills between classes like you could in Awakening Fates and Three houses. You need SP to inherit skills from emblem rings, but it's a completely redundant quantity, since you already need to either spend time fighting or friendship crystals to have the skill be inheritable in the first place. All SP does is limit the player's customization options and leave less room to experiment, since your dudes will constantly be in an SP deficit, unless you grind levels. You won't be able to get more than like 4 or 5 skills across the entire playthrough. If the game insists on having SP, then maybe a system where fighting in actual battles with the emblem would lower the SP cost to inherit? since a unit will be more familiar with that emblem skills. You'll have more skills by equipping an emblem ring, but the downside to this is that you only obtain emblem rings from the story, and for the first two thirds of the games, you will not have more than six emblem rings, unless you bought the day one DLC, which I did not do. There are replacement shitty rings that you can get from this stupid ass gotcha game system that doesn't even be in the fucking game at all. They are way worse than emblem rings, and only some of the rarest rings give you one ability. I've heard that there are some good exclusive skills you can get from the rare various dollar store rings, but the best skill I got was Renewal from Deirdre's S rank ring. You won't have all 12 good rings until the last 4 chapters of this 26 chapter game, but when you do, the customization is great. But for the first 2 thirds, some of your units will be straight up worse. I love all my units equally, I just love some of them equally -er. I think it may have been better if the clearance aisle rings gave one skill no matter what rank ring it is, and just have different tiers for that ability, sort of like the skills in Fire Emblem Heroes. Or just don't have a rank system at all. And if you get duplicate rings, you can merge them and power them up or whatever. You can already merge lower rank rings into upper rank ones, but I'm not spending 10,000 friendship crystals getting S rank ring. That's too much.
Across FE history, the level of character customization has slid between chess piece, being every character has their specific role and only fills that niche, and customizable RPG party member, the ability to build various characters in different ways. There's no correct side to be on, it's just how things have changed over time. The first seven games, there was some customization, like FE4 and 5 had skills, but those skills couldn't really be transferred between characters, so these games are generally more on the chess piece side. 8 introduced branching class promotions, 9 and 10 had skill capacity and learnable skills, and in 10 you could transfer those skills to a different character. 11 and 12 you could pretty much freely change into any class, but each class still had its specific function. 13 and 14 were much more on the RPG party member side, with all the skill transferring and inheritance and everything. 15 and was a remake that did add some stuff, but ultimately back to the chess piece side. 16 was much more on the party member side with its skills and crests and everything. And 17, Engage, starts more on the chess piece side, with extremely limited customization and almost zero reclassing early in the game, and gradually slides over to the RPG side, especially as you unlock more emblems to equip and gain more SP to inherit skills. Hang on, I took so long to finish this video that a month after I beat the game, three patches later, you no longer have to leave the arena to inherit skills, which is nice. But they also fixed the SP deficit problem with a paid DLC emblem, so basically a pay to win mechanic to fix a problem in the core game design, which is not so nice. Chapter maps themselves are fairly well designed with a lot of variety to be unique without feeling too gimmicky like Fate's Revelation maps were. Level up, level down, what the hell? For the most part, there are fewer enemies per map than in previous FE games. They implemented anti-turtling techniques like villages to visit, thieves to stop, and reinforcements spawn behind you telling you to hurry your ass up. It felt like reinforcements were pretty well timed in that I wouldn't spend several turns moving units in the backfield to catch up with everyone else, and instead everyone was engaged in combat. That being said, it is evil to have a ton of reinforcements later maps, but they don't give you any experience, especially in a game where you can level grind anyways, so what's the point? There's not a ton of class variety, and not a lot of theming around what enemies you fight. Some previous games might be like, you go to the mountain country so you fight more wyvern lords, you go to the plains country so you fight more nomadic troopers. That's not an engage, you're fighting every enemy type for most of the game. And I wish the game did a better job of showing which enemies have ranged weapons equipped at a quick glance, like Tellius games have. But on the plus side, most of the bosses move in this game, and they have multiple health bars since you you can't just solo them with a lucky critical. You gotta use strategy of surrounding them with four backup units, then Jojo meme them. On maps with multiple bosses, you'll be fighting one, and then the other one starts gunning it for you, creating some good tension there. The downside is there are so many, ugh, I've been defeated, but I can't fall here, repeat bosses, like holy shit. In a span of I think six chapters, four of those chapters have two of the same dudes fight you, and while they do sometimes have different emblem rings equipped, they're samey fights with the same classes using the same weapons. In Gage's hit rates uses Fates' weird hybrid RNG system, which explains all the 3% hit chances I got hit by. It got so bad at one point, I was afraid that a 0% chance was still gonna hit. You can usually go through an entire FE game without getting hit by anything lower than like 30%, but here 80% never seems so low, and 20% never seems so high than when I was playing Engage. With weapon durability gone, the designers decided, alright, the player doesn't need to buy any weapons, so the player don't need any money, so you will be broke the entire game, especially if you're not doing grind skirmish and especially especially if you're not using Anna, which I wasn't, and especially 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 if you didn't show for the day one DLC, which I did not. They give you so little money that buying basic heal staffs becomes a legitimate financial concern. I was able to stay out of debtor's prison by selling the basic weapons you get from the glowy purple squares, which you only get access to if you're connected to the internet. Overall, with engaged nuke attacks and forged crit weapons and chain attacks and the break weapon triangle, engaged gives you a ton of options to do buku damage to the enemy, so they could either balance it by carefully crafting levels and enemy placement around those different skills, or <laughs> we'll just give everyone a fuck ton of health and defense. Most enemies on hard mode were really slow damage spongebobs. Even swordmasters who are known for their speed were pretty slow. It felt like I had no choice but to use these forged killing weapons and rely on RNG luck to be able to defeat these chancy enemies. And sometimes the AI acts a little goofy. In one chapter, Chloe got hit by a ballista because this game likes to cheat, and she was at 1 HP. But then the enemy flyers attacked Tamara instead of trying to finish off Chloe? Alright. In Sigurd's paralogue, I didn't record most of my playthroughs, so I'll draw some pictures. Sigurd is safely on the second fort with fort bonuses. You conquer the first fort, and then a Kaga Konga line comes out of the second fort. So I'm like, oh my fucking god, there are so many enemies. But then Sigurd uses his Mambo movement to go in front of all the enemies. And the objective is kill Sigurd so you have to fight a single one of the reinforcements. And I'm like, oh, that explains why Sigurd died in his game. He bad at the strategy. 
Here's my starting lineup for Engage Endgame. Please keep in mind, this was my first playthrough. I did not look up any characters or classes or skills or growth rates in advance. I was guessing and figuring things out, so I promise you, I was not cooking with these builds. And I regret not experimenting more. And here's some characters may look low level. That's because I promoted early, maxed them out to level 20, then used a second seal to reset them in their same class at level 1. First up, we got Bebsy and Lucina. After I maxed out her Divine Dragon unique class, I switched her to Swordmaster with her little X-Men logos. She probably would have been better off with Marth after switching her to a backup class since dual assist is redundant here, but it was near the end of the game so I decided, eh, fuck it. Chloe and Lynn, she was the dodge tank. Most of the game, enemies would have 0% hit chance on her. You can't get broken if you can't get hit. That's all I'm saying. Unaka and Byleth. She was a thief most of the game, but changed her to Furry Knight for one extra movement. I would employ her as a lesser dodge tank and goddess dancer and knife chip damage, but often when she would attack, she landed critical instead, which I'm not gonna complain about. Gold Mary and Erica, crit queen. She would take out those fucker dragons in a single attack. And I'm pretty sure Erica is the best emblem in the game. Ivy and Corrin. She's pretty good at everything. Pretty good magic, pretty good healing, pretty good movement. I don't think I had Ivy engage with Corrin a single time. I just used Corrin as a stat backpack since at the time I did not know Corrin's full potential. Corrin joins on a dancer, not the best tutorial level. In fact, I might have had Ivy use a freeze staff instead of, you know, engaging with Corrin and doing a normal attack. Tamara and Ike. She was my team's tank. I heard everyone else use General Louie. Mine couldn't keep up and get enough combats to stay relevant. And Sandstorm is the best class spell in this game. It just beats everything. Bogato and Sigurd. He was there for bow knight chip damage, then canto away to safety. The longbow is really useful in this game. And I mostly had him engage with Sigurd just for the extra movement. Rosado and Leaf. Rosado was amazing in his joining chapter, and not as good in the subsequent chapters, but Wyvern Nords are always at least pretty good. Bulky flyers are great for their utility. Rosado was good at holding off those nine Wyvern Lord reinforcements towards the end of the game. Also, Leaf might be the worst emblem in this game. They did him dirty. Seagull and Micaiah. Dancers are useful utility units to make your good units be good twice in one turn. I gave him Micaiah to heal or warp or free staff in case of emergency. That being said, I don't think I had him use a staff a single time. Celica paired with Caitlyn from the Unova Elite 4. Most of my mages were staff bots until it was time to fight armor units. I'd bring them to the front to do magic and then fall right back. Warp Ragnarok is cool, but if there's more than one enemy nearby her target, she's too squishy to warp in and then stay there. The Citrine. Nope, Citrine and Marth. I ran out of characters and emblems, so she got Marth by default. She is mostly a staff bot or thunder chip damage. But one and a half Elwins on triple respawning Wyvern Lords? Yeah, really useful. Diamant and Roy. Fucking terrible. Easily my worst unit. Should have benched him as soon as he joins. Holy shit, he was bad. So it was quite fitting for him to be paired with Roy, the worst lord in the series. Diamant's personal skill makes the enemy more powerful? You use swords? Hit rate should not be an issue? He's the only character in the game with soul, which which procs off of Dex, so of course his Dex maxes out at 22? He's my only character that maxed out any stat? I'd have to give him a special little forged Brave Axe and engage with Roy to level up his stats to get him on the same level as the rest of my units at base. And even then, at one point I had to body block him with my mages? My mages could take hits better than engaged Diamond? There were two other units who joined late game and contributed so little they're not even worth mentioning. Most early game units I had dropped off. Your Jagan is more Jagan than Jagan. I was planning on using Abs Lady and Bucci Coochie, but they fell off early for me. Maybe I'm just growing Cena, but this is the first FE game where I didn't know everyone's name. Cram and Flam are this unit's Christmas duo and the first two units you meet. I literally forgot they were in the game. I was using Alfred for more than half the game, but my guy did not level speed at all. Look at this. And I tried using John, but he just couldn't keep up even after multiple arena axes to the face. New playable units in Engage are very frequent and very front loaded. There are 36 playable characters and 26 chapters, plus 15-ish paralogs, most of them available later in the game. You'll have 22 characters by chapter 11, and 32 by the start of chapter 16. Keep in mind, on most maps, you can only deploy 10 to 12 units. Part of this is because Engage runs into the Fire Emblem Fates problem, where every character is three characters, a royal and their two retainers. And in each chapter, it's always like, new units, new units, new units. In the first 16 chapters, I think there's only one level where you don't get a new guy? This makes sense early on. Like chapters 1 through 5, you're still fleshing out your army, but pretty soon it becomes too many. Maybe this fits if you're playing on Classic and you suck ass at Fire Emblem, but I don't think most players will be permanently losing this many units every chapter early on in the game? Hello? 
There aren't many memorable strategic recruitments where the player has a gameplay related memory of these characters. Most of them just join. Remember in FE7 where you go to the desert to save some mage from bandits? But then the mage whoops everyone's ass by himself using a spell you hadn't seen yet. And he's like, I'm the mage general of Etruria, but thanks for the assist, I guess. And at the same time, a wall of man shows up with a killer axe and hits critical after critical with a unique battle sprite and animation? Remember in FE4 where you had to strategically kill all the units and the boss without accidentally killing or getting killed by Ira? These are examples of ways past Fire Emblems integrate character introduction, story progression, and gameplay into a memorable scenario. And Engage doesn't really do that. Your only strategy is a fighting strategy. I believe there's only one enemy character you recruit during a chapter just by talking, two or three other phase characters you recruit by talking to them. All of these are very easy to do. The rest are just given to you for free right at the start of a chapter. The most Engage does is, before you fought a guy, now they're your guy. As a result, characters don't get much of a chance to shine and leave an impression before they hit the bench. And because you're so married to the weapon triangle in this one, and unpromoted characters can't use more than one weapon type, it's like, for example, Lapis joins and I'm like, cool, we had one sword and three lances, another sword user will be great. But in the chapter right after that, you get two more sword users. And every time you meet new guys, the game removes deployment slots to make room for new units. So I didn't even get a chance to really use Lapis. So instead of being excited to use the new guys, I'm a annoyed at these new guys because I have to bench someone I wanted to use for this new guy who I don't even know. And in higher difficulties, a small gap in stats makes a huge difference, especially in the early game. So missing an entire chapter, the Lapis girl didn't ever get a chance to catch up at all. In fact, I had to look up her name when writing this. Strategy Gameplay Summary Overall, despite my nitpicks, the turn-by-turn -turn strategy gameplay is some of the best in this series. Hard Classic was a good amount of satisfying challenge for me without feeling unbeatable, and the focus on player phase actions over enemy phase watching makes the player feel more strategically empowered, especially with all the options the game gives you. With a few exceptions, this shift encourages the player to play more offensively than defensively. That being said, I personally would still prefer larger maps, larger movement, more enemies to fight so each individual character has more time to shine, a less front-loaded roster, and less reliance on previous series nostalgia and temporary power-ups over consistent strategy throughout each chapter, also known as every single Fire Emblem game made before this one. The rest of this video is not going to be nearly as positive because large chunks of Fire Emblem Engage kinda suck ass. The presentation. I'm of two minds. On one hand, graphically, Engage looks fantastic. From the drab color palette of genealogy, to the vomit inducing compressed 3D models of the DS games, to awakening models not having feet, to three houses looking like the prettiest PS2 game you've ever seen, Fire Emblem has never set world records in the looks department. But Fire Emblem Engage over here is the cleanest looking FE game, from its bright color palette, to its lighting, to the definition of its character models. And the animation is top notch. I'd still argue that three houses did have some pretty good animations, other than the combat arts and critical hits, which was mostly because any unit could use any weapon. However, Engage's battle animations blow it out of the water. The game makes really good use of camera zooms and whooshy particle effects for that extra pop. My only nitpick is the Swordmaster, nothing personnel, kid. Crit animation is really funny the first time and really underwhelming all subsequent times. Cutscenes are really well animated, but sometimes feel empty. A few characters standing in a big empty room. Could use better staging, or just smaller rooms. While not a thing I used to mention at all since it was expected, the frame rate, as far as I can tell, has always been stable. Windmills spend more than two frames per second unlike other recent games. On the other hand, some of the indoor areas look good, like the Solm Castle level, but some outdoor areas feel kind of uninspired, but ultimately fine. And then there's the overall art direction. Look, I don't shit on games I haven't played for myself. But I make an exception for Genshin Impact. Fuck this knockoff Breath of the Wild looking ass casino ass game. I am gotcha game hater numero uno, and Genshin Impact is chief gotcha. My morning routine involves hopping up out of bed and sipping on that Genshin Impact haterade. If Genshin has no haters, then alert the authorities as I have been slain by the lightning booby sword lady. So when I say that this game's aesthetic heavily reminds me of Genshin Impact, that is not a compliment. The Somnial looks fine, but also looks like a town in a Tales of game that you'd visit once. It's a place to go back to after every single battle, so you'll be seeing it more than anywhere else. I'm not a huge fan of base areas in general in FE games, but while the Monastery in Three Houses felt more like a place where people lived and worked, the base from Three Hopes felt like a fortress base camp, the Mine Palace from Fates you could customize and arrange yourself, but the Somnial feels more like a theme park or a zoo where you admire your characters but don't really interact with them in any sort of meaningful way. More on that later. 
Presentation Summary It's probably the best looking Effie game in the series. However, I would have preferred to see it showcase more of its own unique aesthetic instead of simply following popular trends of today. The music. What music? This was the biggest disappointment for me, y'all. To be clear, none of the music is bad, but it's also stock. It's serviceable. In Fire Emblem and JRPGs as a whole, it usually has some of the best video game soundtracks since the gameplay is basically filling out a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. All of the window dressing needs to be top notch. But here, it's fine. Like, it's not good, it's good enough. It's just background noise. I don't know if it's the samples used, but the musical canvas is not fully covered and left thin. When I play other FE games, I'm enjoying the music as it's playing and usually humming the soundtrack between play sessions. I cannot remember a single song from Engage. I think the desert music goes, hey, but that's it. The exception that's the highlight of the soundtrack are the remix medleys of older Effie games. These remixes are really good. They play one time during the respective paralogue, and in skirmish maps, you can change to those songs in the settings. This game also runs into the Xenoblade 3 chain attack music problem, where the cool, unique remix music that plays during player phase gets interrupted by the extremely generic enemy phase music, and attacking the boss once completely stops the cool music for the rest of the map in favor of the generic boss fight music that plays on every map. Hey, sound designers, if you have a unique one-off song playing, maybe don't interrupt it for music that plays all the time. The only original Engage song I do remember is the fucking four kids anime opening that plays every time we turn the game on. And I only remember that song because it is so fucking terrible. I've listened to and performed so many different genres of music from across the world and across time. This is one of the worst songs I've ever heard. It is pretty catchy in the same way that herpes is catchy. I'm not sure how many layers of irony deep we are when people say they love it, but it perfectly encapsulates the Saturday morning cartoon tone of the game. To be fair though, the remix final boss version of it sounds pretty good. Hold up, there's not even a recruitment theme in this game? And they changed the level up jingle that's been the same for 12 of the past 13 games and in all the spinoff games? Uh-uh, put this soundtrack in gay baby jail. Music summary. The remixes of old songs are cool. None of the new music is bad, but none of it stuck with me either, which is the part of JRPGs I look forward to the most, the music. I was mostly underwhelmed by this game's soundtrack compared to previous entries in the series, especially recent entries. 
personality and character design. Kinda looks like shit. It's been memed on to death at this point, but it's worth reiterating. Why are the main character options fucking Pepsi Man and Colgate Chan? People have gotten used to it in a getting kicked in the balls repeatedly stops hurting after the thousandth time sort of way, but y'all this looks very silly. Why did they not simply engage with better character design? Why did they not engage with color theory? And believe it or not, yes, there is an in-story reason for the hair. But if they wanted to go with a two-tone theme, they could have done it with just the eyes. Or done ombre. Ombre? Ombre? They could have done ombre hair that fades from one color to another. In fact, later in the game, some engaged units do this, and it looks a lot better than going... Other characters do not look nearly as bad as the main character you will be seeing every chapter in story cutscenes. However, every character looks like a VTuber. As someone who is 30 years old and doesn't watch VTubers, that's not really a compliment. Most of these people look like they're a single GTA 5 stream away from being featured in a VTuber N-word compilation, which happens surprisingly frequently. But what do I mean by that? It's not because every character was designed by a literal VTuber artist whose full-time specialty is drawing VTubers, which is what happened here, is that these characters look more like they were designed to be eye-catching and colorful instead of looking like they're all from the same setting, or you know, warriors fighting in a war. Fire Emblem character design usually has one foot in each bin of lettuce, good looking, and looks like some type of soldier. Just look at Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn, Shadows of Valentia. Honestly, every epic game made in the past 20 years. Colorful, distinct designs, but they still look like, you know, they can fight. Engage? Not so much. I don't get the sense that someone like Amber or Bunnet have ever thrown a punch before, you know? Let alone killed hundreds of people. There's also a lot of child soldiers in this one? Like, way more than normal? There's four distinct countries, but characters from the same country don't look like they're from the same country. Characters can have distinct designs while also having connective tissue between this world's cultures. It's not mutually exclusive. In an obviously extreme example, look at Hoshido vs. Nor characters in Fates, or Sakaeans in FE6 and 7. In Engage, there's no prominent connective cultural through line in style or appearance. It feels like they designed a bunch of wacky anime characters in a vacuum and randomly assigned where they're from. Solm is a desert country with lots of sunlight. The Solm royal family looks like this, but the other Solm characters look like this, and I can't help but go, huh, I don't know if I would have done it that way. When reviews said that Engage dials back the social sim aspects for three houses, I thought they meant like you couldn't do the tea parties and the face petting minigame, features I didn't do anyways. I thought it might be more like this game, which I really like. I didn't know they meant the characters in Engage never have a single interesting thing to say. Most of the characters aren't annoying, I said most, which I guess in modern JRPGs we should take that as a major W, but for the most part, engaged characters barely have a personality or backstory with one papaya shaped exception, and instead each one shares one or two fun facts like it's a corporate icebreaker before a ropes course. I like partying, I like weird food and fairy tales, I like cute things, I'm Kmart Claude, I like small animals, I have abs, I'm a chef, it's simultaneously ridiculous and underwhelming. I think Asterisk Man said it best. I may speak in a way that suggests a deeper meaning, but rarely is that actually the case. It is simply another way of killing time. Idle amusement, nothing more. Wow. I like alpacas, but I ride a horse? Why not let him ride an alpaca into battle? Give him an alpaca class, fuck it. But the thing is, all the social sim activities are still there. You can talk to your units, have meals with them, have them watch you while you're sleeping. What the fuck? It's all just half-assed here. I mentioned this earlier in the gameplay section, but characters don't have time to make much of an impression during their joining chapter before they're benched for the next guys who also don't leave much of an impression. Over time, Fire Emblem games have had more moments where side characters get to have more of a presence, being it through showing up later in a main story cutscene when it's relevant, to having unique conversations with certain bosses they have a connection with, to sections where they comment on the events of the story between chapters, to having dedicated paralons. In Engage, the trend line goes backwards in this regard. Characters say there are two lines in the story, or sometimes four lines if they're a secondary noble, and then afterwards they might as well not even be there. It wasn't until the last stretch of chapters I was able to make any sort of attachment, mostly through their gameplay utility. I don't like Gold Mary because she's 
stuck up and they gave her pirate proportions. I like Gold Mary because she can one shot those big fucker dragons for me, but it took a long time to get there. The best characterization is done with these illustrations that happen during the credits. People love these types of drawings in Fire Emblem. Things like this would have been better served during the main game, not during the ending. So that leaves characters to be more developed in their optional support conversations. A shortcoming of many recent FE games is quantity over quality of support conversations and an engage it's hit a breaking point. One note personalities can work for like a boss who shows up says two or three funny lines then dies but doesn't carry well when each playable character has like 33 support conversations and 36 bond conversations man that's just too many. I obviously have not seen every support convo but of the ones I did see it was like 30% decent 70% not worth your time. Surprisingly I think the Three Hopes Warrior spin-off game did it best where not every support level has its own conversation. So you don't spend hours listening to writers try and fill their word quota. There's so much filler dialogue in this game. You can talk to characters after the battle. Don't. There is nothing here. You can talk to your characters in the Somnial between chapters. Don't. There is nothing here. If they didn't want to write unique dialogue for every single one of these characters for every single chapter, then this would have been a great opportunity to bring back base conversations from the Tellius games, where specific characters have special conversations with each other that are relevant to the events in the game. But instead, the Somnial is a zoo, and not because you can have an actual zoo here. Characters are only there to be looked at, admired at a surface level, and no meaningful way to engage with them. These vapid support conversations take place in a vacuum, completely segregated from the story. We're in the middle of a war campaign against the fell dragon, but now we can teleport across the planet and have camping trips. We're fighting a war against the demon dragon, but yeah, let's just go to multiple frat parties. Hey look, it's my suspension of disbelief. <laughs> There are enough distractions in the Somnial to trick yourself into thinking you're not playing Fire Emblem anymore. Like a pretty good fishing mini game. You can play dress up with all your characters in the base, but not in battle, so what's the point? And a shitty DDR mini game. And a shitty pointless fortune telling mini game. And a shitty Panzer Dragoon mini game. And a shitty button mash mini game, which on hard mode causes you physical pain in real life. The best new addition of Engage is Sami, a little pet who follows you around and helps you with the mini games. I previously joked about how this game is Fire Emblem Heroes 2, but now that I've played it, yeah, it sort of is. Now, the cynical me, who rarely shows up, you guys, says that Fire Emblem Engage was specifically designed to appear to players of Fire Emblem Heroes, the mobile gotcha game that made $1 billion from 10,000 whales. Even though the player base has been dropping off since, you know, it's been six going on seven years since launch, Engage has a bland story that focuses on summoning characters from other FE games, mobile game exclusive character designs on the mural that opens up Engage, smaller maps with smaller movement of your enemies, needing to spend SP to learn skills, skill descriptions having the same cadence as mobile game skills, engage having a stupid ass gacha game system doesn't need to fucking be here, S rank gacha rings having a 3% chance, the same chance as a 5 star hero in Heroes, Tempest Trials, the multi map mode from Heroes being in engage, a DLC emblem who's a mobile game exclusive character whose special ability is literally to play Fire Emblem Heroes mid battle, and engage having an in game bonus for linking mobile mobile game save data, a game on a different system that came out 6 years ago, despite there not being any similar such bonus for having save data for the other more recent Fire Emblem games also on the Switch, such as Fire Emblem Three Houses, Fire Emblem Warriors, Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes, Tokyo Mirage Session, Sharp FE, Super Smash Bros Ultimate, or Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light. It definitely feels like at least part of the design methodology was, did you play Fire Emblem Heroes? Well then try Fire Emblem Engage, it's kinda similar. Fire Emblem Heroes is a doo-doo game, and by that I mean I only play while sitting on the toilet. <laughs> Shout out to Altina who carries my team in Aether Defense even though I haven't played in months. And even though I strongly dislike Heroes because I dislike all gacha games, there's nothing inherently wrong with wanting to appeal to players of Heroes. But the cynical me says that Engage's cast is very front-loaded with free and easy recruitments because people don't finish games, so they want you to see as many characters as possible so when these new characters come around in the future gacha game summoning banner, you'll recognize them and be more likely to gamble your money on them. I do not spend money on heroes, but if I did, I feel like I'd be more likely to spend money on characters that I like, that I formed a bond with through gameplay, not just ones I see and recognize, you know? But what do I know, I'm not the target audience for gacha. Oh, and I wouldn't be surprised if either Emblem Rings or the Engage mechanic is brought into heroes, or at the very least, Engaged Alier, Engaged Diamant, etc. are brought in as power crept alternatives in the future.
Character Design Summary The character designs prioritize being eye-catching and following popular trends over simply looking good and fitting the setting of the story they are in. Recent FE games have made steps to flesh out more of their supporting cast. Engage chooses not to do that at all. The best way I've heard the Engage designs described is that they look like pop stars performing as warriors in a school play, not actual warriors fighting a war. Speaking of elementary school plays, the story. What story? There's no story! It fucking sucks! To say that Fire Emblem has always had bad stories is to admit you've not really played Fire Emblem, or maybe didn't pay attention, or maybe you've only played these two and you repeat internet talking points about this one from people who hyper obsessed over it and overanalyzed it to the point where they convinced themselves it was bad actually. In Fire Emblem, there are good stories, there are mm, serviceable stories, and there are bad stories. But the only thing worse than a bad story is a bland story, and that's what Engage is. At least Fates had some funny parts, intentionally or not. We can all laugh at it, it's a great example for future writers of what not to do, and most importantly, they actually fucking tried. They failed spectacularly, this is not a Fates was secretly a masterpiece video, but playing Engage's story gave me a greater appreciation for Fates, because at least there, they didn't go for the most cookie cutter, brain dead, lifeless, limp dick story ever put to print. You know, Mario games usually have pretty bland stories, but Mario doesn't have a dozen hours of cutscenes where the characters have the most generic dialogue you've ever heard. Meanwhile in Engage, the characters talk so much while saying nothing that the switch starts going into power save mode. Even the console is falling asleep with this garbage. You know, I usually have a spoiler chart in these types of videos, or have a spoiler and non-spoiler section. I did not do that here because there is nothing to spoil. Look at the key art. Go ahead and try to predict it. What do you think the story is? You are correct. Actually, divide your low expectations in half first, that's the story. Whatever you think might happen, happens. And I don't have high standards for video game stories. I'm not expecting fucking to kill a mockingbird here. In a video game, as long as I want to see what happens next, I consider that a decent enough story. But I think in a story-driven genre like JRPGs, the story should not be so bland that I'm tempted to hit the skip button on a first playthrough. And I know other people who did, because they'd had enough. Corny doesn't even begin to describe it. If the people of Iowa played this game, oh, they no. would forsake the Bible. Fire Emblem Engage is the new god of corn. You meet a mysterious short character, and then meet another mysterious short character. They're the same person? What? There's multiple fucking pinky promises. Hey guys, I'm a dad. In Fire Emblem. Oh god, why? Characters reciting their entire backstory seconds before they die in a cutscene? Of course. The dragon girl is actually your sister? Why not? The main character dying then coming back to life, then dying then coming back to life? Sure! Marth looks directly into the camera and says, You are the Fire Emblem? Enemies attempting to appear sympathetic as they're dying like an episode of Demon Slayer. Stop doing this! This is bad storytelling! I'm cartoonishly evil. All I've wanted is a family, but I've had a found family this whole time and I'm just now realizing it as I'm dying, oh no! Maybe put this type of scene before the boss fight so the player is thinking about it while they're fighting. The game literally quotes Mewtwo from the first Pokemon movie. Your character is the divine dragon, does not transform into a dragon, unless you bought the DLC, oh my god. There's a last minute exposition dump truck by the final boss, all this shit just coming out of nowhere, going on about multiverses and zero emblem, what the fuck? What are you talking about? My guess is that he's referring to Henri, a character who has not appeared in a Fire Emblem game outside of like a vague silhouette and a costume from Marth in the mobile game. And don't get me wrong, the cheesy story can be fun. Look at a game like Wonderful 101. It's self-aware of the cheese and leans into it. Makes it really entertaining. Meanwhile, while Engage does have some lighthearted moments that may land depending on your sense of humor, overall it tries to take its boring story, boring characters, and boring dialogue super seriously especially towards the end. At one point, a woman shows up and says, Haya Papaya. This is unironically the best written line of dialogue in the entire game because it ties into the character. Naka has a whole backstory where she's an assassin on the run, so she hides her past behind her overly upbeat personality. But it sometimes slips out in her supports and crit quotes. She gets a whole chapter dedicated to just her, where she uses her thief class to see in the dark and uses the emblem Akaya to heal. She leaves a memorable impression. Yunaka is a fan favorite character because she's one of the only characters they actually wrote. Also, she has tickle bitties. It's cheesy and entertaining. More of the game should have been like this, but it's not.
Here's the story on the do I give a shit o graph. In chapters 1 through 9, nothing remotely interesting happens here. It's just, get to the rings, fight the evil army and zombies along the way. But then at the end of chapter 10, the big twist happens. And by big twist, I mean your expectations are so low that this little bump seems incredible. Even though it's the dumbest thing in Fire Emblem history since Erica simply handed Lion the last sacred stone. Look behind you, it's the Elite Four. Ha! When you turned around a second ago, I somehow took all six of your emblem rings and time crystals. Now I can revive the fell dragon. What? I'm not even joking. This happens exactly like this. From a gameplay perspective, it makes sense to take the rings away. You've learned their abilities through usage, maybe even overly relied on them. Now you have to fight the bosses using them. But I don't know. In the cutscene, maybe cast a spell or something. God damn. Chapters 12 through 19, it's slightly better, but still not much here either. It's more, get to the rings, fight the evil army and zombies. Then chapters 20 through 26, it tries to speedrun having an actual story, but at this point, 40 plus hours in, it has established so little goodwill with me that I do not care at this point. Some people have said that the story really picks up at the end. I could not disagree more. It's more so like if you've only ever drank lead poison tap water your whole life, and then you take a sip of diet cherry vanilla Pepsi and go, this must be the nectar of the gods. No, it's fucking Pepsi. I'm glad the game has a simpler story. I don't want to hear any more war crime discourse on Twitter. Or, 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 the game shouldn't intentionally be made worse because a few people can't log off. You can have simple stories and still tell it in an engaging way, through interesting character interactions and good dialogue. For example, Shadows of Valentia is a remake of Fire Emblem 2 and keeps the broad strokes plot synopsis basically the same. Fight the evil army, kill the dragon. But I'm enthralled in every story sequence because the game established their characters well and has entertaining dialogue. But if our ship is astray, then we must chart a new course. Alm is that course. I'll rip that traitorous tongue from your throat! Then you'll finally have the truth in your grasp. I lost friends at the southern outpost. Veteran men, yet dead all the same. <laughs> long enough. Very rude to keep a princess waiting. Very rude indeed. Princess? That would be me, the second princess of Illusia Hortensia! Now then, hello! As more blood wets my feet, they grow heavier with each step. Remorse, resentment, despair. I have dispensed with all such things to come this far. No matter how much lingering regret a person has, after death, they are powerless. They cannot even wish for revenge, much less seek it out. Hatred, regret, those burdens fall on the shoulders of those who are left behind. I guess fell dragons have to die in the end, but I want it to be... A good dragon. Oh. Obviously, these are different games with different tones and different objectives in their storytelling, but this contrast is clearly a regression in quality. I'm not sure where the entertainment value is supposed to come from. Engage's story mainly functions to set up interesting chapter designs. The story serves the gameplay instead of story and gameplay working in tandem. I do not think that good dialogue and good gameplay are mutually exclusive. You can have both. Engage does not. Most of Engage's dialogue is pretty much, we have to go here and defeat the fell dragon, but said with like a billion words. There's no lore or world building beyond the absolute barest necessities. You can donate the cost of a couple of iron swords to double a country's economic output? What the fuck? I don't even think there's an explanation of how the emblem rings even exist beyond the end of the game going, ah, multiverse. The game does not have a lighter tone. The game has no tone. And I feel bad for the voice actors in scenes where they are clearly trying their best with such a wooden script and so little story to tell. We must stop the fell dragon. Welcome to Brodia, my friend. I will help you stop the fell dragon. Are my standards just too high? Should I bang my frontal lobe against a cement block and shut up and enjoy the pretty anime characters saying the most basic things? Is that all it takes? Is that all it takes? Is that all it f 
fucking take! As an anniversary game, Fire Emblem Engage also has the difficult task of telling its own story with its new characters and incorporating 12 previous main characters from 16 Fire Emblem games. It balances this by, uh, half-assing the first part and straight up not doing the second part at all. I remember learning that the emblems can talk and have memories of the events from their games somehow. I thought it might be like Avatar The Last Airbender where Aang would sometimes consult his previous lives for advice. They tell a little story and talk about what they learned from their experience. Nope! The emblems have nothing interesting to say. Despite Marth being the largest character on the art every time you turn the game on, you could replace Marth with fucking CJ from Grand Theft Auto and the story would be exactly the same. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. Why bring back all these characters and then proceed to not use them? Again, everything in the game is to be looked at, not to be engaged with. Hey Lucina, you fought a fell dragon before. You've been through some shit. What do you think of our current conflict? My ring returns to the ring chamber after battle, and I return to whoever wore it last. Okay, great, thanks, Lucina. Really nice talking to you. There are Bond conversations that are mostly filler, but a few times they vaguely reference their own game. I had an accident with fire magic as a kid. Now I'm afraid of it. Yeah, that reminds me of the time where me and all my friends were burned to death right after I learned my kidnapped wife had been brainwashed so she wouldn't remember me or our child. Uh, fuck you, Diamant. Instead, any story reference to previous games is completely isolated in their own respective paralogue, where you play a watered-down version of a pivotal chapter from their game with no context other than the Cliff Note story synopsis. Maybe, as an anniversary game, it would have made more sense to have these types of chapters interwoven into the story, not an optional bulbous growth off of the main game. Playing these paralogues are just like a reminder of better games I could be playing right now instead. Maybe these types of chapters would have served better as a tutorial of what each emblem ability does, instead of a couple PowerPoint slides when you get the ring. Also, Lin's paralogue isn't even from a game that she is in. What the hell? Why not use the final chapter from Lin mode, or the chapter where she joins Elliewood and Hector, or something? Given that this is supposed to be an anniversary game, a celebration of the Fire Emblem series, it feels very tacked on. The connection to the rest of the series is the same type of enjoyment you get from seeing Nick Fury at the end of Iron Man 1. I recognize Thing! It's exciting in the moment, but doesn't have any lasting impact. The final boss summons the final bosses from each game as emblems, which is what the story should have been. You summon the heroes, the villain summons the villains, they fight. But like, they couldn't even put in the portraits for the villains? Was this like a last minute addition after seeing fan theories and realizing that's a much better idea than you fight Marth, but he's red. At least the death quotes are all the same, that part was pretty cool. Story Summary Fire Emblem often has entertaining stories to tell in one way or another. There is very little entertainment value to be found in Engage's story or dialogue, and the characters from previous FE games are entirely wasted here. The best way I've heard Engage's story described is they took the script to every FE game, except the Tellius ones, fed them into an AI, and had a fucking chat GPT write the game. What's supposed to be a serious celebration feels more like an unintentional parody at best, or cynical satire at worst, written by someone who's either never ever played Fire Emblem, despises Fire Emblem, or does not feel like stories in video games can be good or should even try to be good. Overall summary, what we have here is a classic Patrick Star situation, where the gameplay designers, artists, and animators were on Red Bull and Adderall, but the scenario team and dialogue writers showed up on the last day of development sniffing horse tranquilizers. If you only want to play some good ass strategy maps and do not care about the story, I'm giving you the green light. No, the recommendation to skip all of the dialogue. The 30% that is decent is not worth the 70% that's a complete waste of time. If you're here for the story, well I hope Hope you get more enjoyment out of it than I did, but comparing it to the standards set by previous entries and the standards of the time in which this game was released, I am very disappointed. Fire Emblem Engage is a sine wave of enjoyment. For me, gameplay is king, but watching hours of story cutscenes so you have context for the gameplay? That's gameplay, or at the very least, part of the experience and shouldn't be treated like an afterthought. And its overall presence feels like content for the sake of content. Like they made a checklist of everything Fire Emblem games have, but didn't stop to think how we execute these features to serve the overall game design and provide a positive experience for the player. While it's clear that those involved worked very hard to create a well-functioning, high-quality game, it's hard to tell if there was any emotional passion in its overall direction. There's less, hey, I have a really cool idea for the next game, and instead, we own the Fire Emblem IP, let's make another one and get some money. Hopefully there is a genealogy remake coming, especially with the slightly higher prevalence of Emblem Sigurd in the story than any other Emblem character. And as it stands, Fire Emblem Engage is both great and terrible.
That being said, there's no true ambush spawn reinforcements, so it's still the best Fire Emblem gameplay in the past 10 years. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe. Obviously, I'm just one person, so comment below with how you feel about Fire Emblem Engage. And today's comment code word is dental hygiene. Comment dental hygiene if you made it all the way through the video. And uh, that's it, video's over.